Hi, and welcome back. I just want to respond to a few of the comments on my recent EQ Doesn't Cause Face Shift video. First of all, there was no music. Sorry. New tune in the background for this one, just for you. Everyone else, feel free to let me know how much you hate it down below. Next, I think a few people misinterpreted my hint to native instruments. I wasn't suggesting they should update Reactor. They have. There's a version 6 available. I was suggesting they should send me a license so I can use that for future demonstrations. And they reached out already, so you won't have to see that old Reactor again. There might even be an affiliate link down below, if I can figure out how to do it. Okay then, chickens and eggs. I guess they're suggesting that the relationship between all-pass filters and EQ is bi-directional. I demonstrated that all-pass filters can be used to construct EQ-type filters, so can we go the other way and use EQ-type filters to create an all-pass? Or in other words, to create phase shift without changing the frequency response. And in fact, it's not obvious that you can. I can create phase shift with a boost or cut, obviously. So you might think I could add another band to correct the frequency response while generating yet more phase shift. But this doesn't work. The second band corrects the phase shift as well as the frequency response. In case you're wondering, it's not because I'm running both bands inside one EQ plugin. I get the same result if the second band is in a separate instance. The only way I can achieve just phase shift with this configuration is to switch one instance to linear phase mode, which kind of feels like cheating. But hold on a minute. Dinosaurs were laying eggs for millions of years before chickens existed. Here's photographic proof. Clearly then, the phase shift came first, and the EQ followed. But wait one more minute. Here's a different configuration. Now I'm running a low-pass filter and a high-pass filter in parallel. Basically, I've created a minimum phase crossover. And would you look at that? We have a flat frequency response and a fully rotated phase response, just like a second-order all-pass filter. I could, if I was absolutely insane, use this setup to create bandpass, notch, and EQ bell filters, just as I did with the two all-pass filters in the last video. So maybe the commenter was right about the chickens after all. Next up, my video was honoured with a thread in the audio engineering subreddit, full of people arguing that digital filters are not normally implemented using all-pass filters. This is correct, in the sense that I showed a rather clumsy, inefficient method, but I believe that the usual way in which they're implemented is just a rearrangement of the same basic maths. Let me show you what I mean. This is the Robert Bristow Johnson Audio EQ Cookbook, which provides algorithms for all the standard filter types. These have probably been used in thousands of different plugins over the years. Here's the basic filter algorithm. Don't be scared, it's not that complicated really. Here's that same algorithm, very slightly rearranged, as a sync modular implementation. I know I should probably be using my new Reactor 6 for this, but either they've changed the way core cells work, or I've forgotten how to use them. So I'm going to use sync modular for now, which is where I first learned this stuff. Anyway, this basic algorithm takes the input signal at the top of the input list here, and multiplies that by the first of five coefficients. The input signal also goes to this z to the minus one module, which is just a single sample delay, so basically just a buffer for one sample. The output of this module is the previous input sample, and this gets multiplied by the second of those five coefficients. The previous input sample also goes to another sample delay, giving us the previous but one input sample as well, and this gets multiplied by the third coefficient. All these get added together, and the result is the next output sample. But clearly that's not the whole story, because we also have some feedback. That output is stored in a buffer, so we can multiply the previous output sample by our fourth coefficient, and add that into the mix. And it's also buffered again, so that we can multiply the previous but one output sample by our final coefficient, and chuck that into the pot as well. And that's it. This setup can do 12 dB per octave, low or high pass filters with resonance, 
bandpass and notch filters, shelving filters with slope controls, or fully parametric Bell EQ bands. The problem is, we're defining what type of filter we get with these five coefficients, rather than useful parameters like cutoff and resonance. Naively setting coefficients manually is likely to result in speaker-destroying full-scale madness, or more likely just a pop as the feedback loop spirals out of control and the output goes DC. So we need to do some extra maths to calculate the coefficients for the type of filter we want with the correct cutoff, Q and gain. Here's the maths for a high-pass filter. And yes, it does work. If we go back to the cookbook, I'm computing the intermediate variables up here, skipping a few that aren't required for a high pass. Then if I scroll down, we plug those values into the these formula to generate our coefficients. Here's the low pass, and here's the high pass. They're remarkably similar, right? Scroll down a bit more, there's a couple of different flavors of band pass filter, a notch, and guess what? An all-pass filter. When we get to the shelves, it's a little more complicated. But hopefully you can see quite intuitively that these are all just rearranging the same basic maths in slightly different ways. Mathematically, it's just a more efficient way to do what I did in my last video. Bearing in mind that these are two-pole shelving filters with slope controls, unlike the simpler one-pole shelf I created last time. We get a couple of interesting little insights from this knowledge. First of all, the maths required to calculate the coefficients is a lot more hardcore than that required to actually process the audio. This filter kernel is just a handful of multiplications and a big addition. Any modern computer could run thousands of these without batting an eyelid. The coefficients are a lot more complex, however. Note these two trig function macros, which each hide away this kind of stuff. But the coefficients only need to change when the filter parameters change. If you have static cutoff and resonance settings, all this stuff can go to sleep. You may have noticed that modulated filters and dynamic EQs tend to munch a lot more CPU power than static filters and static EQs. Now you know why. And the other insight, a stereo filter processing both channels the same only needs to calculate the coefficients once. It can then plug those coefficients into two channels of filtering, or 12, or as many as required. Which helps to explain why a plug-in running in stereo rarely uses twice as much CPU as the same plug-in running in mono. Finally, a few people seem to think I was setting up another video in which I explain the maths behind all-pass filters, or filters generally. But I'm going to have to disappoint you there. This comment sums it up nicely. It's perfectly simple, it's just a Z-transform. Well, I tried to get my head round all that Z-transform, S-transform stuff, but I'm just not clever enough, I'm afraid. Or I skipped too many math lessons back in my school days. I don't understand it, but clearly it works. So I'll stay in my lane and let the big-brained DSP gurus worry about that stuff for me. Okay, thanks for watching. <laughs>